I guess, I guess you're here for this uh, presentation. No, sadly, Conan O'Brien will not be joining us here at Photonics West. In his place, though, we have uh, William R. Benner, Jr., President and CTO of Penguin Laser Systems. Thank you. So today I'm going to tell you a story, a story about my company, who we are and what we do. A story about the scanners we use, galvanometer scanners and their history. And finally, a story about what we're doing in galvanometer scanning uh, in my company, Pangolin. So who we are, Pangolin Laser Systems has been in business for 33 years. Uh, we, we are the best known company for producing software and related control hardware and lasers for the creation and performance of laser light shows all around the world. So wherever you see a laser show, whether it's at a theme park, amusement park, in a movie theater, or a uh, concert, or anywhere, even in your local pubs and clubs, uh, that's our software and hardware that are controlling these lasers. So I'll tell you a little bit about the lasers themselves. And these days, they're very simple. Uh, they used to be much more complicated. But uh, these days, a laser projector for, for um, laser laser light show applications is very simple. It just consists of one or more lasers and the scanners. There are a couple of other things such as power supply, combining optics, and some safety systems, but it's pretty much just the laser and the scanners. The scanners that we use are galvanometer scanners. Now many people around here may know galvanometer scanners for their use in things like laser marking, laser cutting, materials processing of various kinds, uh, and that sort of thing, as well as laser light show and display applications. What's interesting is as mundane of an application as laser light show might sound, laser light shows are actually the most demanding application for a galvanometer scanner. And the reason is, is because of the wide variety of images that laser, uh, laser galvanometers are, are doing with laser light shows. At one moment, it could be a scan field that consists of random dots the laser has to jump all over the place. At another moment, it may be representational graphics. Uh, and in another moment, it could be what we call abstract imagery, which is gen generated by analog synthesizers. So the scanner has to deal with a really wide variety of inputs. And so there is no way to optimize the Galvo for just one narrow set of, uh, of constraints. So I'll tell you about the first galvanometer scanners, the scanners that were really used in the early days. So this, uh, this fellow right here is Jean Montague, and this other fellow right here is Pierre Brosens. The two of them co-founded General Scanning, and the very earliest scanners were these uh, moving iron scanners here, uh, and the moving iron scanners were really ruled the industry from the early 70s throughout the mid-90s. Now what's interesting is that although these scanners were in very heavy use in the, starting in the 70s, Jean Montague, um, so I'll tell you about these, these scanners here. So if you take a very close look at this picture here, you got Jean Montague here looking down on this laser here, and I'm not sure if that's a full or spectrum. These scanners here, that's very good. And so this was, for this cover right here, an industrial research magazine, in 1975, and uh, John wanted had the idea of doing cloud writing. He called this product the Skywriter. Now, in the you see this image here on the magazine cover. The, the funny thing is that the image actually never just in real life. This was an artist rendition because the weather just wouldn't communicate or, or it wouldn't cooperate with him. A few years later, here we have the very first real laser show that ever took place. It was called Love Light in 1977. <coughs> Here on the cover of Laser Focus World. And it's great to see that Laser Focus World has been with us for that long. It's kind of hard to believe, but they have been. So in and among the stuff that John Montague was working on in 1970, in so much as perfecting and manufacturing moving iron scanners, he also invented the moving magnet scanner here. And you notice the, uh, the patent date here. It was filed in August of 1976. That's 43 years ago. The moving magnet has, uh, scanner has been with us. So here's the zoomed in version of the patent. It was granted in 1978. Now, although 
moving magnet scanners were invented in 1976. They actually didn't make it to market until 1993. Here is a picture of Cambridge's very first moving magnet scanner from 1993, the Cambridge uh, Model 6800. And the reason why there was this long delay between invention in 1976 and final release in about 1992 is because the magnets that were available were not really uh, powerful enough to drive the scanner. They just didn't have the energy density. And finally, in the mid-90s, the neodymium super magnets became available, which really made the moving magnet scanner practical. So why moving magnet? What are the advantages of moving magnet? Well, that can be summarized with these two covers right here. This cover here was made with the original moving iron scanners. And you can see that the, the imagery is rather simple. Uh, and this fuzzy stuff around here was made with optical medium at the time. Uh, it could have been cellophane, which was very kind of common in use at the time. Lasers were trying to kind of make the imagery is as, as pretty and complicated as they can because they didn't have the scanners to do the complication for them. And now here on this magazine cover is we see uh, moving magnet scanners. So the difference is this in our laser light show parlance, we call this 12K that talks about the speed of the scanning. And this was 30K scanning. You see that this is a lot more complex and a lot more detailed. And so this is why the uh, transition from moving iron scanners to moving magnet scanners took place. So in 1995, like I say, the, the actual um, moving magnet scanner from Cambridge was, uh, was demonstrated in November of 1992. By 1995, they had been out for a few years. They had become established. The industry was comfortable with the level of performance that they were getting, which we called 30K performance. And so in 1995, the industry as a whole developed a standard that we call the 30K standard. Now, like I say, that was in 1995. And guess what the standard is today? 30K. Hadn't quite gone anywhere. We'll talk about why. But our scanner, so our software, here's 30K. Here's how fast our software can go if faster scanners were available. So we'd occasionally ask the scanner companies, can you make us a faster scanner? You see that our, scan our software can go a lot faster, and they'd tell us, no. And we'd say, at least they have an idea. They, they didn't just tell us, no, go away. They said, well, it's physics, you know, we're moving a physical object. We, we just think that we're doing things as, as fast as we can. I think we, we're just doing things as well as we possibly can. Uh, and that, that explanation just didn't sit well with us. Uh, and, and, and we felt like it was a self-defeatist attitude. And besides that, if you don't think you can do something, the likelihood of you actually doing it is, is pretty small. And so, so we took on the task of making faster scanners because after all, we, we have here is a story of tension. We have the industry standard here and we have what our software can do way over here. So that creates a kind of tension. We want to fill that gap as the software guys. Um, and we believed that we can do it. Now that belief was completely out of arrogance, misinformation, uh, and everything else. Because I'm an electronic and software guy, not a mechanical engineer. I have no idea how we're going to make things go faster. It just seemed like in in the 43 years since the moving iron galvanometer had been invented, it must be a way to go faster by 43 years. It just seems like it. So we want to go faster. First thing we need to do is answer the question, what is faster scanning? If you turn that question around a little bit, the question becomes, well, why aren't you already going faster? What, what is preventing you from going faster? In this animation here that I had our artists create, we'll see the first limitation. Here, this is what ordinarily happens. You got the beam coming in, it bounces off this mirror, it's going back and forth, everything is fine, everything is scanning really well, the lines are really fast. But as we scan faster and faster and faster, I hope they will speed the animation up here in a second like this. If you take a really close look, what happens is the entire mirror and rotor starts bending to the point where the uh, image is no longer a straight line. Now for the longest time, 
we believed that it was only the mirror flexing. We called it mirror resonance. But the reality is that it was really the entire mirror rotor system that we learned so many years later. So to give you an idea of what this looks like in images, there are some uh, clients of ours, not for our scanners, but who post these images up on our forum and they say, hey, Bill, we've got these funny wavy lines in our scanner. Do you, do you know what's causing that? Yes, we know what's causing that. Uh, that's exactly what I was just showing you, which is basically there is a speed limit associated with the rotor where if you go faster and faster and faster, eventually the rotor just starts vibrating to the point where it makes all these little wavy lines and essentially corrupts the image. So that is one barrier to speed. Another barrier to speed performance is the heat inside the scanner. So this represents the heat, the maximum heat that can be uh, that can be found inside a scanner when scanning at 30K. So this is a scanner that's designed to go 30K uh, with the absolute worst case scenario content that you put into it and the worst case temperature it gets up to 100C. But that's okay because the scanners can take 100C inside. So now if we try to double that and go 60K, unfortunately the internal temperature goes up over 800 degrees and clearly it can't handle that. In fact, even if we try to go to 40K, it more than doubles. So heat is another barrier to performance. This animation here shows you why. With the conventional design that John Montague came up with, the coil wires are put here inside this steel shell. Steel isn't a particularly good conductor of heat. Uh, what happens is as you put more and more current in, the heating that heats the coil also unfortunately heat heats the magnet, and magnets hate heat, hate heat. And the only pathway for the heat out of the magnet is in this area here, which is just filled with epoxy. It's just also another not particularly good way, pathway out of there, the magnet for the heat. So these are the two problems for, the, that is the barrier's performance. One of them is the resonances, and one of them is heat. So I'll tell you the solutions that we have come up with to deal with each of these problems. The very first solution is to make the rotor stiffer. In these two pictures, these are, this top rotor is actually our rotor. This bottom rotor is one of our competitors' rotors. If you take a look really right here, you'll notice that the, the diameter of the shaft is bigger. You'll notice that the amount of the magnet that is captured by this little stub end shaft is greater here. You'll notice that the color of the magnet is different. This is actually a plated magnet, and our magnet is actually not plated. It's completely unplated. And so it's a different type of material. It's stiffer. It produces a, a higher magnetic field. And this, this little, this gap here is bigger, allowing you to put in a thicker mirror. And not only that, but we have this extension, much like these seats. This supports not only your butt, but also your back. You're very secure. This is more like a bar stool which as I think about this is kind of funny, you know, really you need back supports on bar stools, if you think about it. What's gonna happen at a bar? It makes perfect sense that you would want the bar stools to also look like our shafts. So we've made the shaft thicker. In fact, the stiffness of our shaft is two and a half times that of the competitor's scanner. In terms of the heat, we have completely redesigned the motor design. Here you see the original conventional galvanometer running at its thermal limitation. And these aren't artist renditions. This is renditions from FEA thermal analysis software that shows the magnet's 100C, the coil gets up to 130C, the steel shell is around 40, here's the pathway out. And here's our scanner doing exactly the same job as this. What you see is that, for one thing, the coil is buried in steel any heat generated by the coil is carried away immediately. A little bit of it goes into the magnet, but we've got things that are very close to the magnet where the pathway, if the magnet does happen to get heated a little bit, we've got a great pathway out of the magnet for that heat to travel. So it runs cooler. So we've tried to come up with a moniker that explains what it is that we've done. We created a division of my company called ScannerMax. We just took scanners and took maximum performance and shoved the two words together and come up with a little moniker here, stronger, cooler, faster. These aren't three words that we happen to pull out of the air. 
these are three words that try to describe what it is that we've accomplished here. We have a stronger rotor and shaft. That shaft has a more stronger magnetic field, a stronger mirror mounting mechanism. We've got stronger bearing materials and the position feedback, the signal to noise ratio is much higher. The motor magnetic design as I've shown you all is very cool. We made stronger plus cooler equals faster scanning. So we've created a series of scanners that we call the Saturn series. This offers the highest RMS performance of anything available. We have uh, a line of mirrors and mounts available right now that cover two to 10 millimeter aperture, delivering three to four times the speed of previous generations of scanners that we call conventional scanners. So this gives you some examples of what's being done today with our scanners. As you see here, this abstract image has many tiny little lines, many starts and stops, many little dots and stuff like that. Uh, and this represents the kind of thing that our customers are doing today with our Saturn One. While we were developing this high-speed scanner, a uh, customer came to us and said, you know, this high-speed stuff we're working on is really cool, but we've got an application that requires something smaller, lighter, it's for a handheld instrument, uh, and it has to be lower cost as well because it's for consumers. What can you do for us? So we took on that task and developed something that we call the Compact 506. It was originally developed for small mirrors, but then just, just for the heck of it, just kind of for the fun of it, I took a one inch round mirror and put it on that sucker. And just, just for the heck of it, I wanted to see what this thing could do. And it was amazing the performance I could get out of this thing. So that inspired us to make an entire range of scanners, which I'll show you in a second. But this is a real game changer because here's our compact 506 with a 10 millimeter 40 degree Y mirror on it. And you can see actually the mirror is bigger than the scanner. In this industry, it's most often the case that the scanner is much bigger than the mirror. So here's our competitor's 10 millimeter uh, uh, scanner. And the compact 506 with the mirror weighs 13 and a half grams. And just for the heck of it, I put this sucker on a scale and weighs almost 250 grams. And I forget what the multiplier of that is, like 26 times heavier. When you put these things into a mount, an XY mount, it weighs more than a pound. So here's our compact 506. And in the next thing, you see, it's all the same scanner in this. So here we have three millimeter all the way up to 10 millimeter. And the performance is really amazing with this little sucker at about one third the cost of conventional gallows. So, while we were developing all of this, we were looking at trade journals, newspapers, there was the news. You could see it in the news. All you had to do was look at it. High volume applications are coming that sure do look like they're gonna need some scanners. Like for example, 3D printers, self-driving cars, obviously. This thing's in the news practically every day. And consumer laser displays, which is something we've been hoping would happen for a really long time. This was in the news, but nobody was developing scanners for this. This is Wayne Gretzky. He's one of the most famous uh, and prolific hockey players that ever existed. And he was famous for saying when the, when the reporters would come up to him and say, how do you do this amazing thing? How is it that you are so much better than everyone else? He said, well, I don't skate to where the puck has been. I skate to where the puck is going to be. This is where the puck is going to be in laser scanners. We can see that. We can see that even by cutting the price by a factor of three, you can't offer a product, a $130 scanner for a product that's gonna be sold to the retail customers for $230. It just can't happen. Right? So we develop a series of scanners based on a completely different architecture. Just a few parts that can be put together in large volume for $10 with amazing performance. We have the, the line of scanners here. Now, all of these are custom made for, for customers. They come to us and they say, we need a scanner that does this. It has these specifications. What can you do? Uh, we need to make 400,000 of them. Can you do this? Yes, we can do this with our art design. So how do you drive them? So we have a couple of different solutions. We have our Mach DSP, which is a microprocessor based servo driver. Not only does it drive the scanner, but it has built in tools too, a built in oscilloscope, built in function generator, built in dynamic signal analyzer. 
uses industry standard power, plus or minus 15 to plus or minus 30 volts, and it's a little bit bigger than the palm of my hand. This here is my Tesla Model X, and this here is my iPhone. What's common between these two? Software. All the time, my Tesla Model X is getting better. All of the time, my iPhone is getting better. With a microprocessor controlled servo driver, it can always be getting better. When we first released that in about 2014, we had version 1.2 software. Now we're up to version 9.24. You want the latest version? We just send you the new firmware files. A few hundred K bytes, send it through email, done. You have some additional capability, some additional performance for nothing. In an age of swiping right, isn't this, doesn't it make sense that this is where we should be? So if this isn't quite what you need, if you need something smaller, something that requires lower power, we have something here, the size of a credit card. This will drive two scanners. It's a two-axis driver, uh, very compact, runs on only 12 volts. Not plus or minus 12, not plus or minus 24, just 12 volts. So how are we doing in business? You know, we, we released these scanners, we were developing through 2012, our first year here was 2013 at Photonics West, now it's 2019, how are we doing? So we've been able to achieve 50% market share in the laser light show business. Now, it's the 50% that's not made in China. The, the, the customers who build projectors in the United States and Europe are using our scanners. The Chinese are using their scanners, and they're, they're copies of the original 1992 Cambridge Model 6800. So we also use in microscopes, OCT system, and 3D printers. Now, self-driving cars, this is an area of intense development and intense NDAs, and for that reason, I cannot tell you what we're doing or who we're working for, right? but it certainly makes sense that we are, would be working in this industry and somehow, and, uh, and although I can't say much, I did find this very funny meme on the internet, self-driving cars with lasers. So the 43-year-old design that John Montague came up with in 1976 is being manufactured by almost everybody on this trade show floor, except for us. And it just occurred to me that this is like one tool that they are applying for so many, try, try, trying to apply on so many different, different jobs. And as the old saying goes, when your only tool is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. But we've got three different tools that we can bring to bear for different applications. The Saturn series, which offers the highest RMS performance available at the cost of industry standard galvanos. The Compact series, which as you can see offers from the same scanner from three millimeter to 10 millimeter at around anywhere between a half to a third the cost. Very versatile, lightweight, compact. And our arc design, which is the hot, uh, offers industry standard performance at the lowest possible manufacturing cost. Now, where you learn more about this stuff? www.scannermax, and while you're at it, in the news section, you'll see this thing that says, can your scanner do this? So over the time that our scanners have been available, customers write us emails, and they say, can your scanner do this? And I say, I don't know, let's see. And so we will actually mock up an experiment based on exactly their waveforms, wavelength, scan angle, everything, and we develop reports of this. And the reports show what it will do, the scan speed, the step response, the uh, tracking delay, the power consumption, the heating of the scanner, the heating of the servo driver, a very thorough report and lots of different applications. And if you go up there and also go to our YouTube channel, you'll learn about uh, many applications, including these, one of them here, we have compact scanners running 72 degrees by 92 degrees. Another one, 40 degrees by 80 degrees at, with 10 millimeter beams at very high speeds. Uh, we do this all, every month we ship many systems that do this. Uh, Galvo scanning at two kilohertz at 16 degrees. It's, 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 all this stuff is unbelievable. And, and something we just delivered last week is a system that will uh, display a thousand patterns per second. Not a thousand hertz, a thousand actual patterns per second. You can check it out on can your scan can your scanner do this? It's noted up on our website. 
So we have a booth here at uh, Photonics West, it's booth 2343. We've also brought some uh, information packets if anybody's kind of immediately interested. We like the tough jobs, folks. We, you know, laser marking, that's really, that's really a very pedestrian thing. Uh, we, we like the stuff that catches scanners on fire for everybody else. So, so if you've got a really uh, challenging application, whether that challenge is performance or price or, or volume, uh, those are the kind of applications we like to hear about. And so, um, now one thing is, if you're really curious about how it is that we were able to get performance so much faster than everybody else, I did write this book. It's a book on all kinds of laser scanners. It covers, uh, it covers polygons and electro-optic and acousto-optic and MEMS. Uh, it has a special emphasis on galvanometer scanners. But um, chapter 20 of the book tells you exactly how we actually did what we did and goes into very deep details, gives you uh, formulas and FEA plots and everything else, uh, and it shows you exactly how it is that we were able to get four times the performance of the conventional Galvo. So that's my presentation. I hope you like it. <laughs>